Welcome to the Makers and Mystics podcast. This is your host, Stephen Roach. This is Season 2, Episode 7, Poetry is My Protest. I don't believe in writer's block. I believe in breakthrough. I believe in worlds composed of words and words that yearn to become poetry like a dancer yearns to dance. I believe if we seek, we will find. And if we stop to turn aside, we might notice every bush is on fire with light. This is not to deny mundane moments, difficult days, or tragic situations where to invoke the poetic muse would almost seem irreverent or impossible. But in reality, the opposite is true. Poetry dignifies and makes sacrament of the ordinary. Art is always shaped from the chaos and the dirt of our everyday. Art is always made in spite of its obstructions. Art is the offspring of our perceptions. The way we view our world, our lives, and ourselves determines whether we make art or whether the world makes us. But to make art requires attention, without which the fires fade and this bush is just another bush. We react to the world instead of respond. We grow dull and forget worlds are born through words, and so our words become careless and cynical. When we lose sight and sense of the poetic, language devolves into its own internal commercialism. In our age of 140 characters, where everyone wields the power of words, the ancient and analog art of poetry is called upon now more than ever. Poetry humanizes the divine and reveals the miracle within the mud. It keeps us from falling prey to the automaton of our digital age. It reminds us there is a difference between talk and speech. Our words, whether analog or digitized, follow us from an ancient past to build our present and project our future. Words remain the building blocks of civilization. The way we use them determines the world we leave our children. The words we choose become the brick, timber, or straw which scaffold our tomorrows. So here amidst our shifting times, technology leaves its imprint on our languages, social media expands our ability to connect, but as sure as it gives us flight, it casts its shadow upon the ground. Our hyper-connectability amplifies carbonated voices of disgruntled souls whose only joy is their complaint, whose only freedom is their rant, whose only fear is their forgottenness. Sometimes solutions are not so much found within right answers, but in promoting the opposite spirit. The words of the prayer attributed to St. Francis say it best, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy.
I started the February poems primarily in response to the negativity that had become so prevalent within social media. You know, um, I found myself scrolling through one negative post after another, you know, one complaint, one accusation, one bit of propaganda, one triviality. And I just said to myself, there's got to be something better to give her time to than this, you know? And so I started the poetry as my protest really on a playful whim. I wasn't trying to make uh, any political statement. I just simply wanted to put a carnation in the gun barrel, so to speak, you know? I wanted to offer an alternative to the noise that had become so commonplace. And so it did, you know, I just, um, I committed to write and publish a poem every day for the month of February. I had no idea whether or not inspiration would come. I just simply decided that I was going to offer an alternative, that I would offer beauty instead of ashes, that I would, that I would offer, you know, hope instead of bitterness. And, um, and so that's what happened. And 28 days later, I found myself with a collection of some of the best writing that I think I've ever done. What we feed is what will live, is what will grow, is what will name and be named by the will, by our nature, by the sanctions of our indebted hearts, whose articulation owes it all to love. For love alone is life, love alone is art, and art alone will teach us that what we feed is what will feed or feed upon. Us. If we are quick, we may outrun these inhospitable hours. When reluctant cities pause between speech, where oceans inhale between waves. If we are agile, we may stop the circus of our sun long enough to imbibe ourselves upon wonder, to procure the fragrant rest where songs and second natures are born from silhouettes. We go down as water and emerge as wine, germinate the holy in pots of clay. We step across the precipice suspended between fear and fascination, tangled in braids of grace. What's up, everyone? This is Stephen Roach, and April is National Poetry Month. So I wanted to take this opportunity to share some of the poems I've been working on this year, which are going to be part of a collection I'm releasing in just a few days called February, Poetry is My Protest. And later on in this episode, I'm going to introduce you to a good friend of mine, Melina Daniels, and she's going to share a story about an experience she had at the recent protests in Charlotte, North Carolina, and how art and poetry played a significant role in changing the atmosphere there. Uh, but before we get to Melina's interview, 
This is one more poem from Poetry Is My Protest. Risk is never dressed so beautifully as when we dream of her from afar. And when she adorns the lips of poets and preachers whose campfire tales dance madly upon the shadows of young hearts, she flickers in the firelight, giving only a glimpse of her features. We close our eyes, so she lingers, radiant as we remember the womb. Her image falling as our night's last embers digest their wood. By morning, she disappears. And we return to all that feels safe and all that is properly placed. When again, she stands before us, woven of words, formed of clay, of dried leaves and garland. She gives no promise or portent, no call or coercion. And never have we felt more like ourselves than when we follow her past our own translucent skin. I'm here with my good friend Melina Daniels from Overflow Studios out of Boone, North Carolina. And Melina and her husband Jacob have a really incredible story about how their own poetry and their own art uh, played into the protests that were taking place here in North Carolina and Charlotte last year. And so, Melina, I would love it if you would just introduce yourself to our audience and then share a bit of the story um, about what you experienced in Charlotte last year. Yeah, definitely. Um, my name is Melina. I'm currently working as a studio artist in Boone, North Carolina. I spend my days running around a uh, now one-year-old mm-hmm. and working in our studio. And then I still, um, I bartend at night a couple nights a week. There's something about the community and um, it brings back a little bit of my city upbringing to work in kind of a downtown setting with folks, Mm -hmm. um, especially in a, in a bartending setting. But as far as Charlotte goes, a group of us last year decided to go down to Charlotte after, um, one of the shootings that took place. And at that week during the time, there was a lot of violence going on. Um, and just as far as what happened, a black officer shot another Um, African-American civilian and just everything that broke out from that after the recent shootings that were more racially charged. Mm -hmm. um, My husband, Jacob, just saw this vision that he wanted to start painting in the middle of protesters. Mm -hmm. He saw himself just painting people's emotions, people's feelings in the midst of it, that he needed to create something. And then um, all of a sudden our pastor got up and just out of nowhere said, we need to pray for Charlotte right now. And so we started praying. And then I got up and just made an invitation. If anyone would like to come down to Charlotte, we're going to go this week and create a studio space. And multiple people just started coming up and we prayed and multiple people just started literally giving us instruments. They were like, Mm. here, take my guitar. or Hey, I have a djembe at home, or I want you to take this. Another guy just randomly said, here's $200 for art supplies. Another um, person from the community found out, took wind that we were doing this and donated 10 easels, donated hundreds of dollars worth of paints and canvases. So we decided, you know, let's just make this work. Let's figure out what do we legally and realistically have to do in order to make this happen. Mm -hmm. Um, So we went to Charlotte and we called everyone that we needed to call, permit people, um, the city council of downtown Charlotte. And we told them everything that we were doing. And they're like, this is what Charlotte needs. We support this. We want this for our community. Because at the time it was in a state of emergency. But then as soon as he asked, are you affiliated with a church? And we said, um, yes, we are. We are affiliated with a non-denominational church up in Boone. He's like, okay, we have to go through some screenings and 
we have to put you through. We need to know every single text or addiction that's going to be on any type of poster you're bringing down. Wow. And so we, um, we brought a big canvas down that said, destroy, hate, create, mm-hmm. that they were going to, people were welcome to paint on and draw on and write names and just spill Sharpie markers, spray paint, anything that they wanted onto these canvases. And they said, no, unfortunately, we don't, we don't feel comfortable with you saying those things because we've had previous churches come down and have really actually hateful words on posters that mm. offend people and we don't trust you. Wow. It was <laughs> unfortunate. Yeah. That's pretty eye-opening though, huh? Yes. Wow. It was so sad to hear that what we represented has hurt people so much that we've lost all trust yeah. in us. But what did you guys do then? How did you how did you respond to that? So my father um, has a lot of connections with the city. We grew up going to a Catholic church literally two blocks down the road from where we wanted. And he just called up some of the people in charge from mm-hmm. the Catholic church and said, my daughter is with this group of um, community members and university students, and they want to do, you know, our, we called it the outdoor studio Mm-hmm. To, pr- to promote healing for city, um, for the city of Charlotte to experience a healthy way to protest the feelings that they feel right now. Mm-hmm. And he just said, of course, they can set up right in front of our church. That's not a problem at all wow. without even questioning us. So we knocked on the priest's door and we said, hello, we're Melina and Sophia. Sophia's my sister. Our father spoke to you you know, along about our, our admission. He was like, absolutely girls, anything else you need? Like, here's the corner. And this corner was only two blocks from where we originally thought it was right across from two art museums. It was also directly across from, uh, African American hip hop festival that was going on. It was literally called the African American R and B festival. And so we were like, this is awesome. There's yeah. so much art yeah. and energy and music already happening. Yeah. And it was also a mecca of um, transportation, people getting off the bus, coming from work. There was a parking deck next to us. So we still had just hundreds, almost thousands of people walk past us throughout mm-hmm. the whole day yeah. to see what we were doing. So what did you do when you were there? Did you guys paint? Did you invite the community to be a part of what you were doing? What what did the city end up allowing you to do or to say? So we had about five easels Mm -hmm. with a plethora of canvases. And we had just tables with paint and spray paint and Sharpies laid out. And I had my six foot tall spoken word poem written out Mm -hmm. that we put up in front of everyone. And we had a print of one of Jacob's paintings, Imago Day, of a black man ascending into heaven. And that painting was his perception of the ascension of Christ um, in modern day. And that painting was a vision Jacob got six months before the Charleston shooting at the church. Mm -hmm. And he got this idea to do a modern day time of what Jesus would look like ascending into heaven. And this painting is one of the most famous religious paintings out there. There's hundreds of churches and cathedrals and just um, renditions of this painting in very traditional settings of a white man that looks very old and sad and crucified ascending into heaven. And um, Jacob wanted to do a a contemporary version of this. So he had this vision and he took a photo of one of our friends, RJ, and um, took 25, 30 photos of him Mm -hmm. and photoshopped him to look like he was ascending Mm -hmm. and was like, I'm painting this man. And this painting is beautiful. It's six foot by four foot hanging in our in our church gallery. But fast forward six months, and Jacob was like, I don't know how to, I don't know what I'm doing with this painting, but I want to name it Imago Day, which means the image of Christ. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden when that church, that church shooting happened in Charleston, um, Jacob felt compelled as a love offering or a gift to send a large print of that painting down there mm-hmm. as an expression of condolences. So he sent it down with a couple, a family that was going just to visit and love on these people. And when they brought the painting into the church, the women that were handwriting thank you letters Mm -hmm. saw it and they just 
fell to their knees and they're like, oh my gosh, that looks just like them. That looks just like him. Come over here. Come over here. Check it out. Look, that's him. That's him. And the group of women were just gasping at this painting that looked just like the youngest member of one of um, the men that were shot that Mm. dove in front of his grandmother to to save her. And um, he died from the shooting but saved his grandmother. But it literally looked identical to him. That's and incredible. Jacob had no clue. Um, I so love that. <laughs> we had that painting that sparked a lot of um, attraction. And we also had signs that said, please help yourself to paint, to draw, to pick up a djembe or a guitar. We had those laid out. And just to express yourself in any way possible. Open invitation. So throughout the day, as people in business suits walked past us in pencil skirts and blazers, um, they would stop in mid track and they would take out their phones and they'd start taking pictures and then they would come closer and they'd ask questions. And some of the students that were with us would just hand them a paintbrush without asking and be like, here, do you want to write something? And, you know, eight out of the 10 times we would hear the, oh, no, 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 no. I can't draw. I'm not an artist. I'm not, I'm not creative. I can't even draw a line. And we're like, no, just, just share what you feel, write something, anything you want. And then you would see them just kind of soften mm-hmm. and unfold. It's almost like they melted when you gave them permission mm-hmm. to go up to that easel anyways. And all of a sudden, you they wouldn't stop. And you would see them just writing poems or they wrote names of loved ones or they wrote things like, we need each other or love each other or love has no boundaries. Mm. Or they would start drawing pictures of... Um, flowers and birds and rainbows and just very unorthodox drawings and images. But you could see these people just kind of melted in this space Mm. where they could be still and just share what they wanted to get out in a creative manner. Wow. There's one woman that started painting and out of nowhere, she just started saying, sharing thoughts that she had in the week about suicide Mm. And that she was just feeling really down. And one of our people with us said, I have a word. Um, if we could pray for you, I feel like you're suffering from some back pain. Is that is that true? And the woman just starts weeping. And it's like, yes, I have a lot of back pain. Mm. And then just starts confessing about her lifestyle with um, some people in her family have been a part of satanic worship not her people in her family and she just sat there as we prayed and laid hands on her and you could she felt a release she said her back pain was completely gone but she just felt a release of any oppression she's been carrying yeah for years wow well you know one of the phrases that i've been repeating over and over for the past couple of years is that we are invited to be the architects of hope for our Mm. culture. And, uh, and that phrase just sticks with me. And I think in, in particular, uh, for the artists, for us to be architects of hope, uh, what you guys did in Charlotte is such a beautiful example of that, of, of just taking beauty and placing it in the midst of a context of pain and bringing redemption just through the simple act of being present in a really tragic, painful time. You know, um, I've said it before, like a lot of times when tragedy happens in a, in a city or in a situation, a lot of times, whether it's poetry or art, your first impression may be that these things are inappropriate or these things are mm-hmm. frivolous, you know, that, that they're just not the appropriate response. But even in the Bible, that is the response. It's like uh, in Isaiah when he, he talks about beauty for ashes, you know. Mm, that's to, what I was thinking. You know, giving you beauty for ashes. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and so it really is functioning in the opposite spirit. And I think that as artists, we really have that invitation because it's through the arts that we can see the beauty of God perhaps more uh, easily pronounced than in some other areas of life. You know, it's uh, mm-hmm. the arts really carry an immediacy to the transcendence and to the beauty of God. And 
when we take action like you guys did and just go and be a part of the culture, we really can uh, see beautiful transformation and we can become architects of hope. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think mm-hmm. I think one of the the breakdowns even earlier in our conversation when you talked about the the mistrust that had been sown between the church and the culture, I think honestly, a lot of that mistrust comes from the church's own tendency uh, to be segregated from the rest of culture. Yes, and, yeah. You know, and and I think that's um, I'm seeing that change, but I, I do see that that the subculture of the church and a lot of the ideas that the body has carried uh, has been based on a misinterpretation of the scripture to be in the world but not of the world. I think a lot of mm-hmm. times people have taken those scriptures and and then we've we've separated ourselves uh, into our own little subculture. And so there's a chasm between the church and the culture that doesn't have to be there. And quite frankly, it's damaging for Absolutely. the you know for the church to be in its yeah. own, own subculture. So I I think what you guys did, uh, and that's my own heart. Even in my own music and my own mm-hmm. art, you know, I I, I've I've been more comfortable outside of church context a lot of mm-hmm. times than than even in church context. Just because, oh I, yes, yeah, you know, um, and I understand that yeah, it's like sure. we've created this discomfort mm-hmm. to cross over mm-hmm. back into a a realm of people that when you're the only, let's say, believer and you're in a larger pool of unbelievers, Mm -hmm. yeah, you feel like this very small fish Mm -hmm. in a really large, scary, Mm -hmm. dark pond that you don't know, you can't see the bottom. So you're like, I don't want to jump in this. Mm -hmm. But um, that the way you live your lifestyle has been so attractive to us because I see that when it's I go back to just the reason why I love bartending is because these people are so raw yeah. and they're just so unfiltered mm-hmm. and they don't know my beliefs. And so they say whatever they want, yeah. but they're, they would never say that if they knew if I was like, if we we're having this conversation right. in a, a more what the world perceives as a religious or churchy context. Right. And it's like, instead of them meeting us, here where we feel comfortable it's our duties to go in where we feel uncomfortable but they are comfortable and we need to cross over and meet them where they are in their pain or brokenness or yeah and i think that even uh you know with whether it's bartending or whether it's performing in venues or whether it's uh setting up an easel and a spoken word uh Mm -hmm. in the midst of a culture in the middle of a protest, honestly, you know, wh- whatever yeah. it is, I, I think it helps break down this idea of us and them that has Absolutely. been so damaging. And that's true whether that's racial reconciliation mm-hmm. or whether that's reconciliation within the church or whether that's reconciliation uh, between the church and culture. And mm-hmm. um, we've we've heard taught for so many years uh, that we are salt and light, but and that's true. Those were the, the analogies that Jesus used. But we've often taken that in a context of us and them. And so our interactions with the culture at large has only been, well, let us come show you where we're right and you're wrong. Or mm-hmm. let us, let us um, we're going to come in and infiltrate in this very militant metaphor way of engaging the culture and the result has been more damaging than transformative. And so I think that artists like you and Jacob, uh, we have an opportunity again to be the architects of hope and to break mm-hmm. down the walls of us and them. Uh, yeah. I want you to read the poem or the spoken word piece uh, that you put up in downtown Charlotte. If if you have that, I would love yeah. for the listeners to hear that piece. And Absolutely. Um, and you can, if you have backstory on it, you can tell a little bit about it before you set it up, or you can just dive uh-huh. in, whatever you think. Yeah, I wrote this right after the Charlotte shooting. Um, the Charlotte shooting was of Keith Lamont Scott. He was an African American man that was shot by Brentley Vision, an African American police officer. But this was right after a series of shootings of white officers. On black men. And despite the facts or the news or anything that accompanies that story, um, people were just in pain and hurting. 
And this was about not choosing the sides of who's right and who's wrong, because our media and our presidents and everyone wanted to talk about well, who was right in the situation and who was wrong. And that just furthers the separation between uh, us and a them mentality. Right. right. And so this was written also right before um, the presidential election. Mm-hmm. So um, I'll begin. This isn't about if you're white, black, Muslim, or gay. No sides to be picked, no war to be made, no blood to be shed, revenge, or betray. We are each other's brothers and sisters. Don't let injustice prey. On our skin, beliefs, gender, or last name. He called us his son, his son died, erased all the blame. The ball's in our court, stop the hate, quit the game. This isn't about who you side with and the presidential candidate. It's about loving your enemy, being a neighbor, and the discriminate. That wants your body to decide how people react to this world's hate. Let us forgive, not forget, but love, dance, paint, create. This isn't a hashtag, it's a movement to move our hearts from segregate to appreciate. That's amazing. Thank you for reading that. Thank you for sharing. Thanks. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Absolutely. This isn't a hashtag, it's a movement. I love that. Thanks everyone for joining us on Makers and Mystics. If you'd like more information on the February Poetry is My Protest collection of writings or about Jacob and Melina's art, you can find that information on makersandmystics.com under this episode's description. And if you'd like to support Makers and Mystics and the Breath and the Clay Creative Arts Movement, you can do so there as well. We certainly appreciate your support, and we'll see you again in just a few weeks. This isn't a hashtag, 